Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Mouse and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be covering another case for my Curious Case series. Before we delve in, I'd just like to say that we'll be running the first poll on Friday for the community voted case over on my Instagram. So be sure you're following me over there on Instagram so that you can take part, vote for your favorite case for me to cover at the end of the month. You can find my Instagram just by searching it's Joshua Miles, hit that follow button and you can take part. I'd just like to point out this video has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. Any theories discussed in this video are just that theories. They are not facts and they shouldn't be taken as such. Any theories and opinions discussed in this video do not represent the views of myself, law enforcement or anybody else involved in this case unless otherwise stated. As per usual, my sources for this video can be found in the description box down below. A lot of information in this case actually comes from an article on Wired.com which has been adequately sourced and is actually backed up by a lot of local newspapers. This article was written by Lauren Smiley for their October edition and it provided me with a lot of insight into this case and was really useful in piecing everything together and the whole timeline together so massive credits go to Lauren Smiley and that article. Again, you can find that source linked in the description box down below. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. Karen Navarra, who was often known as Cookie to her family and friends, was born on the 7th of October 1950 in California. She was born to her parents Adele Navarra and Dominic Navarra, who all lived on a ranch in Warner Heights. Before we go any further, I just have to point out that there are no photographs of Karen or her family available online, and I'm not sure whether that's just because her family didn't want images online or released to the press, or for other unknown reasons, uh, so Please don't be angry or disappointed in me if you aren't if you don't see those images in this video because they just don't exist online. We don't know all too much about Karen's childhood or her growing up. But we do know that her father Dominic did own a pharmacy and it was in this pharmacy that Karen grew up. She often spent a lot of time in the pharmacy, hanging around with her dad and other members of staff in the pharmacy, picking up on everything it takes to run a pharmacy. She quickly began to take prescription requests from customers as soon as she was old enough to do so and under the watchful eye of her father, she trained in everything to do with becoming a pharmacy tech. Karen actually then went on to study science at a local university, I believe the San Jose University, before going on to become a pharmacy tech at a local hospital. I'm unsure whether Karen specialized in this science degree, whether it was biology, uh, medical sciences, or whether back then it was simply just called science. I was unable to determine. Karen loved working as a pharmacy tech so much that even by the age of 67, she was still working in a pharmacy as a pharmacy tech. In fact, she was working in the same local hospital that she had started working in post-university. Sadly, Karen's father, Dominic, passed away in 1996 closely followed by Karen's grandmother. And as a result of her grandmother's passing, Karen actually inherited her grandmother's house. And her grandmother's house was located in San Jose, so it was a really good location for Karen. According to Wired.com, Karen lived on her own in San Jose, but she did share her house with two cats, who she deemed to be just as important as family. California state census data shows that the majority of those aged 
65 and older in the state live with their spouse. However, it also shows that 36% of women and 20% of men over the age of 65 currently live alone. A further 2% of those over the age of 65 in California actually live in nursing homes. And the senior population in California is booming with more and more elderly people being left to live alone, becoming isolated, and becoming quite lonely. This all means that Karen's situation living alone wasn't an uncommon one. Thankfully, Karen did share her house with her two beloved cats, who she treated just as closely as family. She also wasn't completely alone, and she did have family that lived in the surrounding areas. However, they didn't come over that often to visit, but they would phone her all the time to catch up. Despite living alone, Karen led a very outgoing lifestyle. She was always happy and cheerful, working as a pharmacy tech at the local hospital, and was, according to some sources, always friendly and welcoming to everyone she met and came across. Karen, working in a hospital, was also quite health conscious, and she wanted to be sure to keep fit. So she actually went out and bought a Fitbit so that she could track her health. If you don't know what a Fitbit is, according to Wikipedia, Fitbit products are activity trackers, wireless enabled wearable technology devices that measure data such as the number of steps walked, heart rate, quality of sleep, steps climbed, and other personal metrics involved in fitness. This device allows a user to accurately track their activity, and it's very popular with millions and millions of people across the planet owning one of their devices. According to her mother, Karen lived a very busy life, often going between work and home, uh, which meant that she didn't have a lot of time for any romantic relationships. In fact, she hadn't actually had a romantic relationship for a very long time. Karen, though, didn't seem to be too bothered by the lack of romantic relationship in her life. She seemed entirely satisfied living by herself with her cats. She seems content living with her cats and content with the garden that she tended to. That was until Saturday the 8th of September 2018. It was on this Saturday that Karen's stepfather Tony, who was 90 years old, would bring over some biscotti and pizza on a surprise visit. This visit would be the last time that anybody would see Karen alive, ever again. When Karen didn't show up for work that following Monday on the 10th of September, Karen's co-workers grew quite concerned, as it was completely out of Karen's nature to not show up without good reason. Their concern quickly grew into sheer worry as Karen failed to show up on Tuesday, and then when she didn't show up again for a third time on the Wednesday, her co-workers went to the police and requested a welfare check to be carried out on Karen and her home. But this welfare check wasn't actually carried out until the next day on Thursday the 13th of September, and this was when the police went to Karen's home to check on her, and when they went into the home, the responding officers were confronted with a scene that would give them nightmares to this day. Karen was found seated at a chair at her dining room table. She had sustained major impact wounds to her skull and also had two slits going across her throat. Karen was found holding an eight inch kitchen knife in her right hand. It seemed initially to the investigating officers that Karen had actually committed suicide. The investigating officers quickly noticed that there was a lack of blood splatter which would have been present if she had cut her own throat. This lack of blood splatter means that Karen's throat had been slit post-mortem after she had died. Further, a medical examiner actually determined that the wounds that she had 
sustained could not have been self-inflicted. She wouldn't have been strong enough to inflict the head injury wounds on herself. And I believe that some of them came from an angle which would have been impossible for her to do to herself. The investigators quickly turned Karen's home into a crime scene and began to scour the house for any further signs of a homicide. They discovered that in this apparent staged suicide, there were actually signs of a struggle with chairs being pushed over at the dining room table and kitchen drawers being pulled out of their units and things just all messed up. But the strange thing about this was nothing had been taken. All of Karen's jewelry, her electronics, and even her money just stayed sat on the counter. Nothing had been stolen from the house. It seemed as if it couldn't have been a robbery gone wrong and that it was almost as if this too had been staged along with the apparent suicide. The police were at a complete loss as to who might be responsible, so they decided to go talk to Karen's mother and stepfather. And it was when they spoke to Karen's stepfather, Tony, that they realized that he would likely have been the last person to have seen Karen alive on that Saturday. When the investigators asked Tony what exactly happened that Saturday when he last saw her, Tony told the investigators that he had simply popped by, given her some biscotti and some pizza, chatted for about 15 minutes before leaving again. Apparently their conversation was fairly uneventful, however Tony pointed out that Karen did mention that she was meeting up with either friends or a friend later on that day. Tony couldn't pinpoint or remember exactly whether she had said friends or friend. Bear in mind, Tony was 90 years old. Tony explains that he had taken over the Italian food because he knew just how much Karen enjoyed Italian cuisine and that Tony was in fact himself Italian, so he had made it himself. Tony had lived in Sicily when he had been a toddler, but he was actually born in Chicago in 1928. But when Tony was a teenager, he moved back to the US from Sicily in Italy due to speculation of being drafted into the army if he stayed in Italy. Now what's interesting about this conversation that Tony had with the investigating officers is that he actually presented them with a lead in this case. According to Tony, a few hours after he had dropped off the food at Karen's house, he had been honked at by a car that looked similar to Karen's as it passed by their house. Importantly to note, Tony claimed to have seen a passenger sat in the passenger seat of Karen's car, but he couldn't give any description of this person at all. This lead was the first major lead in this case, and the investigators were quick to chase up this lead and find anything to support Tony's claims. Maybe the person that Karen had planned to meet up with later had been this mystery person that was sat in the passenger seat, or maybe this mystery person had sinister intentions, or could even give the police more of an insight of where Karen went that Saturday. The police began to retrieve CCTV footage from houses along any routes that Karen could have taken from her house and past her mother and stepfather's house. Now, unfortunately, as the crime rates in the area they were living in at the time were quite low, almost every house along the route didn't have CCTV surveillance cameras or only had cameras pointing away from the road into their houses, like a camera on a doorstep pointing at the door so you can see the person. It didn't really show the road. They managed to recover footage from just one camera however and when they looked at the footage from that saturday afternoon it didn't show any car matching the description of karen's car traveling along the road karen might have taken a different route or maybe this CCTV footage wasn't accurate in its timings. The investigation had seemingly come to a dead end. They decided to go back to square one. 
the crime scene. Most notably, they wanted to go back and analyze Karen's remains in more detail. The investigators began to go through the autopsy reports, and when they did go through them, they discovered that Karen had actually been found wearing a Fitbit on her left wrist, a Fitbit Alter HR. Data from this device was quickly extracted from it with the help of people from the Fitbit company. It was determined that Karen had a fairly regular heartbeat during the day and she took an average amount of steps that somebody of her age and her occupation would take on a average Sunday. That was until 3.13 p.m. It was at this time that the Fitbit didn't log any more steps, and it's believed that it was at this time at 3.13 p.m. that Karen had sat down at the dinner table. The data from the Fitbit then showed Karen's heartbeat dramatically accelerate at 3.20 p.m., followed by a massive drop. The Fitbit data then detected a slow and weak heartbeat until 3.28 p.m., where unfortunately the heart rate monitor in the Fitbit detected that Karen had flatlined and her heart had stopped. Further to being able to track heartbeats, Fitbits are able to track activity and are able to use their GPS to accurately track this activity. The investigating officers wanted to determine whether Karen had been moved post-mortem and this was because the crime scene had been staged so it was possible that Karen had been placed in the chair at the dining room table um, post-mortem after she had been killed, perhaps being killed elsewhere. They thought that it could be likely that this friend that Karen was meeting up with, who Tony had seen in her car with her that afternoon, could have killed her or be involved in killing her elsewhere outside of the house and then brought her back and set up this staged suicide. But the data from the Fitbit shows that Karen didn't move at all. She didn't leave the house when she got to that one spot, which was at the dining room table. She didn't move again until the medical examiners moved her to take her remains to the morgue. This concretely told investigators that Karen had been killed in the same chair at the dining room table that she had been found in. She had seemingly been murdered while eating her lunch. It is important to note that forensics teams actually found pizza crumbs around her feet. In fact, I believe they actually also found a slice of pizza at her feet too. The police then made a second breakthrough in this case. They had received camera footage from the ring doorbell of a neighbor's house. According to the manufacturer's website, a Ring video doorbell allows you to get instant alerts when your doorbell is rung, allowing you to view who's at the door via its camera and speak with them from anywhere in the world. The Ring video doorbell can also be used as CCTV surveillance. The Ring video doorbell can also be used as CCTV surveillance as it features motion sensors that activate the video recording features. This video doorbell, along with the Fitbit, provided very important data and pinnacle data to the investigating officers in this case. Footage from the doorbell depicted a Toyota pull into Karen's driveway at 3.12 p.m. The doorbell camera was then activated by a passing car at 3.33 p.m., which showed that the Toyota was still parked on Karen's driveway. This event of the Toyota still being parked on Karen's driveway occurred five minutes after the data from the Fitbit showed that Karen's heart had stopped. The next images from the doorbell camera showed that at 3.35 p.m., the Toyota had left. It had, was no longer parked in the driveway. Sadly, the video quality of the doorbell camera was not good enough to be able to distinguish any valuable details from the Toyota, despite the fact that it was a Toyota. It wasn't high enough quality to be able to determine who the driver was, if anyone was sat in the car seats. After all, this doorbell camera was you know, designed to show you video footage of someone close up to it, so it probably didn't have a good focus on things going on in the background. In fact, the doorbell camera wasn't even just across the street from Karen's house, it was more like at a corner, if that makes sense, um, That and, it, and you could see Karen's driveway from 
this corner. And that all made it a lot more difficult for the investigating officers to find any distinguishing data from the surveillance footage. The investigators quickly realized that they had actually spoken to somebody who owned a car that matched the description of the Toyota seen on the doorbell camera footage. And not only that, this person had also told the police that they had gone to Karen's house that Saturday afternoon and they had taken her biscotti and pizza. And that person was Tony her stepfather. Tony was arrested on the 25th of September 2018 on murder charges and was brought into the police station to undergo interrogation. When presented with the data evidence taken from the Fitbit and the doorbell camera, Tony claims that the data must be unreliable, that there must be some kind of glitch on both devices or something to that effect. He maintained that he was innocent. He said that Karen was still alive when he left her home. The interrogation went on for hours upon hours with the interrogating officers using a wide range of different techniques to try and extract information from Tony. During these interrogations, simultaneously, the police searched Tony's house and during their searches, they actually found the that he owned the same brand of knives as the knife that had been used to slit Karen's throat, the one that was found in her right hand. Tony explained this away, saying that he had been a butcher at one point and that they were family, so it was normal for families to share these kind of possessions with one another, kind of like hand-me-downs, that kind of thing. The searches of Tony's house also uncovered traces of blood in some shirts in Tony's dirty laundry hamper. Tony explained this away too, saying that it's probably his own blood, he must have nipped himself or something like that. Further in the police forensic searches, they actually found traces of blood in the sinks all over the house, and they found found a blood splatter on the sleeve of a jacket belonging to Tony, a camouflage jacket. All deceased items were taken and sent off for DNA testing to see whether the blood or DNA on the items were Karen's, whether they matched Karen's or not. Tony's family were quick to begin hiring a good, strong defense team and started building a defense in preparation for trial. The defense team had Tony take a polygraph test, which he actually passed but if you've been on my channel for a long time, you'll know just how inaccurate polygraph tests are. There's a reason they're an inadmissible in a court of law. Um, they are not reliable and they shouldn't be used um, to prove someone's innocent or innocence or guilt, otherwise they'd be used all the time. Interestingly, in the defense, a cigarette was actually recovered from Karen's kitchen, and when that cigarette was tested for any DNA, it actually returned several markers for an A Asian man. It's important to note that neither Karen or Tony smoked cigarettes. However, the prosecution was quick to point out that there had not been a blood splatter on the cigarette and the cigarette was um, placed on top of a blood splatter, which could indicate that the cigarette was placed there um, in a kind of staging attempt to try and stage or frame somebody else or leave the blame to somebody else. Or, you know, the person who did this might have killed Karen and then had a smoke and just tossed the cigarettes um, after the crime into the kitchen. That's when the DNA test results came back from the laboratory for the blood found on Tony's jacket. And by this point, it really wasn't looking good for Tony. The results confirmed that the blood on the sleeve of the jacket was in fact Karen's. This was concrete admissible DNA evidence that would play a very important role in the prosecution of this case. The data from the Fitbit and the Ring video doorbell has the potential for inaccuracies and glitches. According to some sources, an independent experiment was carried out on a number of Fitbit devices alongside a medical grade heart rate monitor to determine the accuracy of Fitbit's heart rate tracker. On average, the Fitbit was off by an average of 15.5 beats per minute, which is quite a considerable amount. The same experiment was actually carried out by Fitbit themselves, and they determined that their devices were highly accurate. And of course, this experiment was funded by Fitbit. Fitbit wants to sell more devices. They're not about to fund an experiment that 
could look bad on their devices or hurt their sales. It's just another case of being sure to look at who the funding body is of a experiment. The accuracy of a wrist activity tracker device such as the Fitbit relies a lot on the positioning of the device on the wrist, how tightly you wear the device and your own composition. These inaccuracies in the Fitbit devices could see the data be made inadmissible in court during the trial. That's why the result of the DNA evidence on Tony's jacket being Karen's blood was such a pinnacle piece of evidence in this case. It was concrete, it was almost impossible to argue against. And after all, a jury, if they see that, you know, there's blood on the on Tony's jacket, they're going to be quite quick to believe 100% that Tony had been the person that had done it. The defense came up with a rather interesting theory as to why there was blood on Tony's jacket. According to the defense, Karen had already been injured or hurt by the attacker when Tony pulled up to the house. And when Tony had knocked on the door, Karen and Tony had hugs and Tony gave Karen the biscotti and pizza, and then Karen went back inside. The, that was that was the defense's theory. And it was in this hug that the blood transferred from Karen onto Tony's jacket. The defense goes on to say that it had been very likely that the killer had murdered Karen shortly after Tony left. As we can expect, the defense also attacked the inaccuracies in the Fitbit data. Although for us to be able to accept this theory put forward by the defense, we'd have have to presume that the attacker midway through an attack would have heard this knock on the door and let Karen go and answer the door. And not only did Karen answer the door, she answered the door very happily and warmly and she gave no indication that anything was the matter. If she had been cut, she would be in pain, something that's very difficult for somebody conce to conceal. She would potentially have, you know, be able to communicate through her eyes just the way someone looks. She would be probably very pale, she may be shaking, she may try to escape or something like that. It would also mean that Tony would have had to somehow miss the fact that Karen was bleeding. For that blood to have transferred, it would have been likely obvious that she was bleeding. So somehow Tony would have had to, you know, talk to Karen for 15 minutes and hug her and everything and not notice anything was wrong, which is a bit strange to me. That doesn't add up. The prosecution claims that Tony um, presented Karen with a plate of pizza at the dining room table and following that he bludgeoned her to death. It is also important to note that a few months prior to Karen's death, Karen had actually phoned up her mother Adele, Tony's wife, and told her that she had seen a man watching her from across the street. When Karen's neighbours were questioned, they told the investigating officers that they had heard screaming um, that sounded like someone saying, no, get off of me and let me go. And they had heard that at around the same time that Karen was murdered. However, despite hearing these screams, neither neighbors reported anything to the police. They didn't call the authorities. This case that the prosecution built against Tony seemed pretty solid and pretty indestructible, but there's one thing that was missing a motive. Why would a 90 year old stepfather who was described by his family and his friends as being really warm and loving out of the blue without warning and without seemingly any reason murder his stepdaughter? We will sadly never find a resolution in this case. Tony had been awaiting a trial for over a year before he was taken to the local hospital on the 22nd of August, 2019, due to a deteriorating health. On the 10th of September, 2019, at 6.12 p.m., Tony was pronounced dead after succumbing to pre-existing medical conditions. He was aged 91 years old. Throughout the entire time that Tony had been incarcerated, his wife Adele stood by him completely, Adele being Karen's biological mother. Tony and Adele insist that Tony was completely innocent and they insisted that up until the day that Tony died and Adele still insists that to this day. Um, and that the in investigating officers had got the wrong man and they were they were looking in the wrong places. I couldn't actually determine whether the investigating officers had followed up on the claims that Karen had seen somebody watching her in the months prior to her death. 
Tony actually suffered from a number of short-term memory issues, which was a fax that was used by both the defense and prosecution when they were building their cases. Perhaps Tony did commit the murder, but then simply forgot about it. How would a 90-year-old man commit such a brutal murder, however? How would that same 90-year-old man who had alleged short-term memory issues then post the murder after such a massive um, exertion of energy, then be able to stage a suicide and then also stage a second crime scene of a attempted robbery gone wrong by like, you know, pushing the chairs over and pulling the kitchen drawers out um, and then planting a cigarette in the kitchen. That doesn't quite add up either to me. This case is one of those cases that leaves me absolutely heartbroken for the family. Adele, Karen's mother, has not only lost in a brutal fashion her daughter, she has also lost her husband. Karen's death actually came not too long after Karen's brother, Stephen, had died in a motorcycle accident, so Adele had also lost all of her children and both of her husbands. My heart really goes out to Adele in this case and I really hope that some justice is found and the investigating officers are able to locate or figure out who is responsible. I'd be really, really interested in knowing what you think about this case, so be sure to leave a comment down below letting me know your thoughts and theories. Remember though to remain absolutely respectful in the comments and that's everything that I have for you in today's case. Again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Lawrence smiley from wired.com for the amazing article she wrote about this case as that really was a great backbone to uh, creating this video i've left all my sources that i've used in this case in the description box down below so you can go do your own independent research if you love true crime podcasts then be sure to check out my true crime podcast that I have with Dark Curiosities, Molly Westbrook, and Kirsty Sky. It's called Crime Time, and you can listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere that you can listen to podcasts, all the apps, all the services. You can find a link to that in the description box down below, or you can go to the crimetimepodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you want to see more true crime content, and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post. And with all that being said, I will see you in the next case. Now.